if I were the king, I would be so angry at Harry's behaviour, not just because of the sense of betrayal. Hello and welcome to Off Script. My name is Stephen Edgington. As Harry and Meghan continue their attacks on the royal family, I'm joined by the historian Simon Heffer to discuss the couple, the coronation of King Charles, and what the future holds for Britain in 2023. Do you think that Harry and Meghan are being fair in their attacks on King Charles and his son? I don't know. I suspect they aren't. Uh, it's very dangerous to talk about other people's private lives, their family lives. One never knows what goes on inside of marriage. One never knows really what goes on inside of family, unless it's your marriage and your family. And while there are many experts who are talking about what's going on at the moment with these two different branches of uh, the House of Windsor, no one really, apart from those involved, knows what really goes on. I think what we can objectively say is that no member of the royal family, certainly no one born into the royal family, has ever behaved as indiscreetly and as offensively towards the family as Prince Harry has. I mean, you know, uh, in the modern age, in the media age, no one has behaved like this. And his conduct is pretty reprehensible. He may well have opted out of the royal family, but he should be aware that in no family, whether it's a royal one or an ordinary one like yours or mine, does anyone come out with any credit when they start slagging off somebody else, particularly slagging off the head of the family. And I think his attacks on his father, and particularly his, now his attacks on his brother, are really very ill-judged and very foolish of him to do them. OK, he's got a book to sell. Uh, I'm an author. Um, I've managed to sell some of my books without going on and vilifying members of my family in the process. And I think probably he should have thought long and hard before attacking the king. Not necessarily because the king is popular, although I think the king has made a very good start to his reign and is popular. But simply because it looks so cheap and it looks so petty and it looks vulgar. And those are things that people who do not expect our royal family to be, uh, even semi-detached members like Prince Harry. So I, is he being fair to them? I don't know. I suspect he isn't. Is he behaving wisely? Certainly not. Now he claims, Prince Harry claims, that he wants to reconcile with his family. He wants his, his brother back, his, his dad back, that's what he says. Do you think he's being genuine in this attempt to reconcile? That depends on how stupid we think he is to be honest with you. Um, I mean, if any of us, again, has a fight with a member of our family and decides to conduct it in public uh, <clears throat> and decides to release family secrets uh, in public and then expects that member of the family who has been humiliated and vilified to come back and say, well, actually, let's be friends, then that's a very naive way of looking at it. I mean, I don't know Prince William, but I suspect he's not Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I suspect that Prince William's own views are very much that his brother should have played by the rules. He's chosen not to do so. Uh, in fact, he's broken the rules in a pretty comprehensive way that no other member of the royal family that I can think of uh, has ever done in modern times. And that it's going to be quite a long time and require quite a change of circumstances before there can be any reconciliation with any of them. I think there's a distinction between the king as Harry's father, looking at how he behaves, and the Prince of Wales as Harry's brother, looking at how he behaves. I imagine, and again, courtiers have said this to me, that the, the king as his father longs for a reconciliation. But Prince William is not Harry's father, he's Harry's brother and also he is the man who at some stage in the next I don't know, 15 or 20 years is going to have to take the firm over and and run it and Harry is not making that process any easier for him and also appears to be making it difficult in order to make money you know whether it's the Netflix documentary whether it's the book this is all about the ringing of the cash register and Harry didn't need to put himself in that position he had a job for life had he chosen to do it and it seems that his wife didn't like the terms upon which the job was conducted. Well, that's fair enough. No one can compel her to want to be a member of the royal family. But maybe they should have thought about that before they got married. And having made the break, maybe it should be a clean break, rather than a break where he keeps coming back 
like a very bad dose of food poisoning and keeps saying every few days some new atrocity about his family. But this is his way of wanting privacy, I'm sure. That's what he claims anyway, by uh, going out and doing these interviews. It's an extraordinary thing. Um, but what about these, what about these, uh, these accusations that he's making? I mean, maybe, maybe he is justified in, um, in doing these interviews and writing these books and things if, if what he says is true. So, for example, he, he talks about the palace leaking against him um, and him not being able to respond through official channels. And he also obviously talks more recently about these, um, this idea that, that Prince William uh, assaulted him or, or shoved him. Um, so w would that justify in any way Harry's actions now? I don't think it's a good idea for people to wash their dirty linen in public, whether they're royal or non-royal. I don't think that others feel highly uh, or think well about people who betray their family in that way. If any member of the royal family had committed a serious criminal offence against the Sussexes, you know, a serious assault, a violent attack, then possibly fair enough, but there's no evidence of that at all. This seems to be like a bit of a, a scrap, a bit of rough and tumble between two brothers, you know, both of whom are, are former army officers. They can look after themselves. I mean, this idea that you know, poor old Harry's sitting in a corner being beaten senseless by his brother is nonsense. Now, I was in Madrid recently speaking to some Spanish students, and they were asking me about Harry and Meghan, and they'd watched this documentary on Netflix. And I thought it was interesting that even these people, these Spanish students, had seen this thing, and you know, they're having a big impact around the world. What do you think the impact of their comments is having on, on Britain's reputation and on the monarchy's reputation? I felt until, I suppose, the autumn before the Netflix series that it was having a pretty bad effect on our international reputation. But then you realise, first of all, that the people who are complaining most vigorously about it are, frankly, rather crackpot people who write for the New York Times and who know as much about my country and the culture of my country as I do about you know, Botswana. So let's forget about them. I'm also quite interested that and much of the media reaction in America to what's, what was in the Netflix programmes is very negative. They thought Harry was basically just whining, which he was. Um, they hated the narcissism of it. Um, and I saw that touched a raw nerve. I saw that the Duchess of Sussex recently said that people who accuse her of narcissism were racist. Well, come on. Um, she is a narcissist. Uh, nobody who portrays uh, her life, and in his case, his life, as openly as they've done in a broadcast can be anything other than a narcissist. So um, I think that the damage that's been done to the royal family's reputation has now been countered by the excessive behaviour of the Sussexes and by the rather dignified response to it of the king and the queen, who just smile and carry on. I mean, if I were the king, I would be so angry at Harry's behaviour, not just because of the sense of betrayal, but I would think that my wife, the present queen, the queen consort, put up with about 20 years of vilification from newspapers before and after her marriage to the king. And she never complained. She just got on with it. And I think one reason why she is so admired now and has been such a success as Queen Consort is that people remember what she and the Prince of Wales, as he then was, had to put up with, with newspapers and television documentaries having a go at her, you know, painting her as some sort of scarlet woman and so on and so forth. Again, presuming knowledge of the king's first marriage that they didn't have. And it is, I think, a, a measure of how people expect the royal family to behave, that the king and queen, despite what they've had to put up with in the past, have just carried on and not noticed this. But I imagine that the anger is seething below the, the surface. Having said that, I still believe that if Prince Harry genuinely wanted a reconciliation, his father would give him one. The problem is going to be his brother. Let's talk about an, another accusation that you mentioned there that Meghan Markle makes um, or, or accuses sort of Britain and the royal family and the press of, and that is racism. Do you think that we have treated her as a country, as, uh, you know, as, as tabloid newspapers or even as the monarchy? I mean, she makes these implications that the monarchy is in some way um, or racist or members of the royal family are racist. Are any of these accusations justified? I don't believe so. I've, I've known a number of members of the royal family. I've never heard any of them express a racist sentiment. The late Queen went out of her way 
to be you know, what we now call inclusive. I mean, the Commonwealth for her was hugely important. And you know, she spent decades um, treating black people as her equals, as they were, and as you know, she should have done. And she set an example for the family that you know, there is one race of people, they're human beings, we treat everybody the same. Um, it's inevitable that an aggrieved person of colour like Meghan Markle would want at some stage to play the race card. But she's playing that card. I don't think anybody else is. I'm not aware of any obvious um, attack on her that is motivated by the fact that she has a mother who is a black woman. Let's talk about the coronation of King Charles. Now that's coming up in May. It's an exciting moment, exciting, exciting ceremony for the country. Um, do you think that there should be a scaled back coronation? You know, we've got high inflation, budgets are under a, a tight, everyone's sort of trying to save money, or should we have the full, full fat version? Oh, I think the public have expectations of a coronation and that it's important for the health of the monarchy that those expectations are fulfilled. Don't forget, in 1953, we still had various foods on the ration. Um, you know, never mind high inflation. Inflation, by the way, which is going down at a rate of knots now. No, I think that there should be as big and as magnificent a coronation as our history merits. And I heard it said at the time of the late Queen's death that because of changed health and safety regulations since 1953, you can't pack as many people into Westminster Abbey as used to be the case. Well, that may well be so. So I hope the King will think very long and hard uh, about who is on the invitation list and that he invites people who represent the very best about our country. Don't just invite somebody because he or she is a member of Parliament or he or she is a member of the House of Lords. Um, invite people who are special to this country and who reflect the best about this country. I think if you do have a list of people who are basically just also rands and fellow travellers um, and you know, people who, ex who think they have a right to be there, that could cause problems. But in terms of spending money, I don't worry about that. There'll be so much additional tourism. There'll be Americans over here, Germans over here, spending dollars and euros like there's no tomorrow. I don't see that there's a problem. Before the late Queen's death, were you confident in Charles being a good king, to be a good king? I've always been confident about Charles being a good king for the simple reason that I think he knows better than anybody else the exact nature of his mother's legacy. Uh, I think he was immensely dutiful and respectful and loyal to the memory of his mother and he knows that he has this institution in trust and he will not let it down. But I think also he is very fortunate in the Queen uh, and that I think the Queen has had the most marvellous effect on the King in the, what is it now, nearly 18 years that they've been married. And she's a very down-to-earth person. She's enormously popular. When people meet her, they instantly like her because she's completely genuine. And I feel that he will be helped enormously in his conduct of the office of king uh, by his wife. And I think the country will increasingly realise how lucky it is to have both of them. When you look at the elected or appointed heads of state of other countries, uh, I mean, I often try to imagine who we might have as our head of state if we didn't have a monarchy. And, you know, some of these ex-politicians, I don't want to be sued for libel, so I shan't name any names. But some of the, the idea of some of these former senior politicians of ours ending up in retirement as our head of state just chills the blood, to be honest with you. So I know he's only been king for a matter of months now, but do you think he's handled it well so far? I think he has handled it well. Um, the only thing that's worried me was the reaction to the um, argument uh, created by the, the remarks of Lady Susan Hussey yes. to a black lady at a reception. I thought that for someone who had given 40, no, I think 60 years of service, to the royal family, Lady Susan was treated pretty peremptorily. Shall we just remind viewers what happened? Yes, uh, this lady turns up very colourfully dressed, uh, clearly advertising an African heritage, and uh, Lady Susan, who was lady waiting to the Queen forever, um, says, where are you from? And she says she's from Hackney. 
And then Lady Susan, I probably rather indelicately, says, well, where are you really from? Uh, and I think by that she wasn't trying to say you have no right to be here. She was saying, you're dressed in a very interesting costume. Um, I'd like to know a bit more about your heritage. What is your heritage? She didn't phrase it in a way that is now deemed to be correct and acceptable. And um, you know, that evening, her um, godson, the Prince of Wales, said, well, there's no place for racism in the, in the royal family. Well, of course there isn't. But that implies that Lady Susan is a racist, which I'm absolutely sure she isn't. And I think that the jerk of the knee was a little bit swift there. I don't think Prince William should have said that. I think he should have said that, you know, if it was interpreted as being an offensive remark, then it was deeply regrettable. And he should have defended his godmother and said, I've known her all my life, and I'm sure that she was not being deliberately offensive. Uh, and it's a generational thing. It's how people of, of that era, I mean, Lady Susan's over 80, um, used to, you, you, that's the sort of question they used to ask. So um, I feel that the, I, I know that since, the King has made gestures towards Lady Susan. I think she's going to the coronation, which is quite right. She's been a great servant of the royal family and of the country for, as I say, 60 years. But that was the one moment when I think that a, a slightly firmer hand should have been on the tiller. I'm not for a moment suggesting that this woman didn't have some right to feel offended. Uh, but I think it could have been dealt with in a much more measured way rather than the slightly hysterical way that it, that it was handed. There is a certain level of hysteria in Britain surrounding racism and the royal family, particularly with these attacks from Meghan Markle. So maybe it's understandable that they felt that this issue was very sensitive. Oh, I can them. see that, absolutely. And, you know, if you've got the king's daughter-in-law wandering around basically saying that, uh, you know, the royal family are institutionally racist, then uh, you have to be very sensitive to this sort of thing. But I think it would have been much more, it would have been quite straightforward to say that while we are, deplore the fact that any offence was given to this woman, um, that you know, we sincerely believe that Lady Susan is not racially prejudiced and was not making a, mark that was, um, a remark that was deemed, you know, she deemed to be offensive. Well, this has been a criticism perhaps that goes into sort of a broader um, level of criticism against uh, now King Charles from some conservatives and they say that he's too vocal on environmental issues that he gives too much he's being basically too political in a way that the Queen never the late Queen never was so do you think that that, that Charles has been a bit too political in his life generally or, or what do you think well I think if you end up being uh, as an adult he was 21 in 1969 Prince of Wales for you know 53 54 years um, you're you're going to find it very difficult to keep your mouth shut about things that interest you. And the Prince of Wales doesn't have the constitutional position of the monarch. Um, since he became king, I know he didn't go to COP27. Uh, he, he understood then that his previous um, embracing of environmental issues was not perhaps something that everybody agreed with. And therefore, he wouldn't be um, uh, controversial about it. Uh, I'm waiting to see whether he makes any more pronouncements about architecture. I think it's quite all right for the king to say that a certain building is abominable. I think if he were to start criticising, shall we say, the general standard of social housing in this country, that would be a political statement because it's, it's, something, it's a service provided by the government. And he should be very careful about getting dragged into that, however much he might object to some of the quality of our social housing. We don't know what goes on in his private conversations with Mr. Sunak. Um, I hope that when he sees Mr. Sunak, he impresses upon him that he has worries, whatever they may be, whether it's about the health service, whether it's about people being able to feed themselves, um, and that Mr. Sunak might argue back that you know there's a limit to what you can do with the resources that the country has currently got. So. Um, I think at the moment it's absolutely fine, and I'm sure that his Prime Minister, because the King understands what a constitutional monarchy is, if his Prime Minister ever says to him at one of their audiences, and you and I will never know this in our lifetimes, uh, look, sir, I think you went a bit too far the other day in that speech, then I think the 
the king would say, OK, I accept your judgment on that and I won't do it again. You know, he's new. And when the queen had been on the throne as long as he had, she was 26, she'd been a naval officer's wife, she'd never had the opportunity really to go and embrace any great issues and speak about them. Um, and the late queen was far from stupid, but I don't think she had the level of intellectual curiosity that the present king has got. I don't think that she found political or semi-political subjects that gripped her imagination in the way that his imagination is clearly gripped by the way that people live in this country. I mean, he's interested in, you know, when he was Prince of Wales, in the Prince's trust, in business, in the community, uh, the, the, all the architectural uh, projects and ideas. Uh, you know, he was really trying to make a difference with something like Poundbury, whatever one thinks of it. And um, I think, you know, generally the work he did there and with his charities was, was very good. And you can't expect him to switch off. Now, the late Queen never had that hinterland. She never had time to have it because she was on the throne at 25. So um, I think we need to give him a little bit of understanding. Now, we did a whole hour talking about Queen Elizabeth II after, just after her death and we talked about her legacy. And I think that she really was a unifying figure for many Brits. Obviously, she came to the throne in 1953, is that right? 52. 52. And at the time, you know, Britain was a very different country and, 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 and our views towards the monarchy was perhaps different. I think that um, our understanding of tradition and our culture and our history has maybe been eroded somewhat, particularly among younger, younger Brits. Maybe you disagree with me on that. Do you think that Charles can be that same unifying figure that Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth II was? I would disagree with your contention that uh, we have a, should we say, a, well, maybe I'm putting words into your mouth, but a less deferential or less respectful view of the monarchy than we had in 1952. I think deference in this country was largely killed by the Great War. And certainly after a second war, there wasn't very much of it left. I think that's a, a wrong reading of history. I think, if anything, because of the Queen's length of service and the fact that she just kept on going and never put a foot wrong has enhanced respect for the monarchy. I think there's probably more respect for the monarchy at the time of her death and at the time of King Charles's accession uh, than there was 30 or 40 years ago. And paradoxically, I think that's not least because of the way she saw the monarchy through those difficult years in the 90s when the Prince of Wales's marriage broke up, when Princess Diana was killed in a car crash. Um, when Windsor Castle burnt down, I think that people looked at her and thought, my God, you've handled this with dignity in the end. However hysterical some people were at the time of these events, in retrospect, we look back and the Queen did an exceptional job. And so I think the King has had a slightly easier legacy than might otherwise have been the case. Is he capable of being a unifying figure? Yes, I think he is. I think he's shown that already. I think he has shown an explicit understanding of the nature of a constitutional monarchy, which is what our, our way of life is all about. And I think that he has made it clear that he shares the values of most of the people in this country. We have very few Republicans, not least because the Royal Family, family behave themselves quite well. I also suspect, by the way, that the idiotic behaviour of Prince Harry and his wife uh, and their constant displays of narcissism and self-obsession are <laughs> going to make people more sympathetic towards the King and indeed towards the Prince of Wales uh, because they'll say, well, why on earth should these people put up with that sort of attack? So I think he has got off to a good start and I think he is more than capable of being a unifying figure. One other consideration you must bear in mind is our political class and I've written about politics, um, not least for this newspaper, for 40 years, is more unpopular now than it's been, I think, in my lifetime, and more held in contempt. That, I'm afraid, is a consequence of the, the Boris Johnson uh, premiership, you know, which ended in shambles, and then a 45-day premiership by his successor, which for different reasons ended in a shambles. And I think to have a, a head of state who is steady, charming, dutiful. It's a great contrast and I think people value it. Now you talk about British values or, or Charles shares the values of, of the people in Britain. The, the interesting thing that he that he faces or one of the challenges he faces is, is almost unprecedented for a, for a monarch 
is the level of change in Britain's makeup in the last 70 years. So we are more diverse than we have ever been. We have more religions, people you know, coming from different cultures and backgrounds than we've ever had in this country's history. And to be able to unite those sort of di those diverse communities is, is, is a challenge. And I don't think there is one shared set of British values that everyone signs up to. You know, people from various different communities may ha may hold slightly different values, etc. That will be a challenge for him to to be able to unite these different sort of groups within Britain. The Prince of Wales, when he was Prince of Wales, was always talking about his hope that he would one day be a defender of faiths rather than just defender of the faith. Now, I don't undermine his. Um, sense of duty in being Supreme Governor of the Church of England and I'm sure in his coronation oath he will swear to do that just as his late mother did. But he's also made it abundantly clear that he respects the right of others in this country to practice whatever religion they wish. And you know we used to have a, a, as it were a one-party state in terms of religion. Uh, in 1829 we had Catholic emancipation we allowed Jews to sit in Parliament from, I think, 1858. Um, we allow people of all religions, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, whatever, to take a, a full role as equal people under the law in the running of our society. But these were very small groups of people in the, 18, in the 19th century. I think we can overstress, I mean, I, th I think this country is still 85% white. Um, so, you know, we can over uh, stress how many diverse minorities there are. The key thing is about our minorities is they're equal under the law and they should be equal under the law. The king recognises that. The king has never said anything that I'm aware of, and my God, we would be aware of it, to say that any other religion is not the, you know, as worthy of respect and of tolerance uh, as uh, mainstream Anglicanism. So, uh, you know, he's very much got that view. And, you know, he has, over the years, one thinks back to him going out into mosques, temples, synagogues, and, you know, embracing representatives of other religions and saying, look, um, you know, you're part of our society. And, you know, what people do in their spiritual life, what they do in the privacy of their own homes, that's a, you know, a deep British value is to respect their right to be different. All we ask of all our citizens, irrespective of their race, colour or creed, is that they buy into the rule of law, to, into democracy, and understand you know, what we understand by a civilised society, the indigenous population, if you like, what, what, you know, what the evolution of values really since the Civil War has been here, and we ask them to subscribe to them. And almost everybody does, because they are enlightened, decent values that make people happier. And that's really, you know, what an ideal society does. It's a new year, 2023. I'm sure everyone's aware of all the challenges that Britain faces. Are you generally pessimistic or optimistic about our future? I don't know, actually. Um, I think so much relies on what's going on in Eastern Europe at the moment. Uh, I would like the war in Ukraine to be over as, as swiftly as possible, obviously. I would li like it to be made clear to the Russians that they have lost and that they have engaged in an unpardonable act of aggression which cannot be tolerated and cannot be repeated. What I, what I am pessimistic about is that whoever replaces Putin, and I feel that Putin will not last that much longer, I hope I'm right about that, is that whoever replaces him isn't worse than he is. Um, I don't see why we can't be friends with the Russians. I don't see why we have to um, have this uh, almost non-stop, since 19, 1917 really, uh, since the revolution, this non-stop tension and aggression between the West and the East. Um, the Russians showed themselves in the years after the fall of the Berlin Wall to be ready to embrace capitalism, to be ready to embrace Western ways, I mean, most Russians had watched Western programs on television and thought, gosh, why don't we have a lifestyle like that? Why don't we all have nice cars and nice state-of-the-art fridges and stereo systems and the rest of it? Uh, and I, I don't dispute that there are many Russians fighting in this war who are hating every second of it and wish they weren't there. 
and um, their families are obviously distraught. I mean, these are people like us in many respects. And there's a few lunatics who run the system who are determined to recreate the old USSR and it can't be allowed. And I think if we can get that sorted out, if we can get the war over and you know, try to move Russia towards somewhere towards a democracy where it can be ruled by people who are accountable to the people and don't rule by fear, then the whole balance of the world changes. Um, but you know, if the Russians don't lose soon, don't end the war in Ukraine soon, um, and they start imposing you know, energy restrictions on large parts of Europe, then the Western economy is going to suffer quite seriously. And that, to my mind, is the great obstacle to prosperity. In our own country, I don't like living in a country that is quite so highly taxed. I think we have a far too large um, public sector. And uh, it's only going to be by cutting public sector payroll. And that may include the National Health Service, although I stress not people working in professions allied to medicine. Um, but bureaucrats, uh, we need to have a proper audit, really, of every job in the public sector and see whether it's worth paying for, because we are still living far beyond our means. We are taxed more highly than at any time since the Second World War. That is not a recipe either for liberty or for the advancement of our economy, and something has to be done about it. Now, there's a sort of list of things you could mention about being pessimistic. So record levels of illegal migration, record levels of legal migration as well. Obviously, highest inflation in 30 years, highest tax burden in, in 70 years, massive, massive public spending, as you mentioned. The economy is struggling. Perhaps we're going into recession. Um, perhaps we're going into a worldwide recession. Is there any reason to be optimistic? I think if we can uh, get this war over and done with, as I've said, then yes, I think that that will improve the basis upon which our economy is is built. Um, clearly the National Health Service has become something of a religion in this country and its stewardship is pretty poor at the moment. I think there's got to be wholesale reform of the National Health Service to ensure that genuinely sick people get care immediately. One of the most scandalous things that hasn't happened in the last 12 years, because it was 12 years ago that the Dilmot report came out, is that Conservative governments have not acted on the Dilmot report and have not created a proper insured social care system. The main reason it's quite clear why our National Health Service isn't functioning is because there's a lot of elderly people who are incapable of being discharged from hospital, but who are not actually ill, um, who are bed blocking and uh, something has to be done about that, not just for the short term, but for the long term. And everybody needs to start making provision for care. We no longer all die at the age of 70. Uh, you know, when I was a boy, somebody who was in their 80s was a very old person indeed. People in their 80s now have looked, looked like people in their 60s, looked when I was a, a boy 50 years ago. So um, we haven't, the, the, the need to provide for our society has not developed with the society itself. And some that's a vision that is necessary. I'm not talking about taxation, I'm not talking about the state providing care. I'm talking about people being compelled in the way that if I go on the road in my car, I'm compelled to have insurance. People being compelled to insure themselves against the misfortunes of old age. And that way we can have a fair society and a much better functioning National Health Service. And no government's had the guts to do that. It's about time that they did. So if that happened, I'd be very optimistic. Um, you talked about record levels of legal immigration. I don't mind legal immigration. That's absolutely fine. This country needs people. My God, we need doctors, for example, and nurses. So yes, um, that's fine. Illegal immigration does worry me greatly, not least because of what policemen tell me about the high uh, coincidence of gangsterism in London with some of the people who've been migrating illegally into this country over the last two or three years. And I don't understand why we can't deport these people. People who come here, you know, there are plenty of legal routes into this country and there are people that we need and we welcome them here. 
and they again I go back to this old point they live equally under the law once they get here and enjoy all the benefits that the rest of us take for granted but um, why we cannot deport people who are not fleeing persecution who've come over here for purely economic reasons for their own economic reasons and quite often to engage in criminal enterprises I simply don't understand and it's the sort of thing that one day could bring a government down and I hope it doesn't but I hope it will be treated before it gets to that stage but it's a grave problem that I think many ministers being transported around London in their chauffeur driven cars don't actually quite understand. Now Conservative voters have for decades been promised by Conservative politicians that immigration would become would become under control. Um, you know, Brexit was there's a huge reason that people voted for Brexit was for border controls. And I think a lot of people feel a bit betrayed by that. I mean, if as I mentioned, 1.1 million people came into the UK last year, net was about 500,000, it was 600,000 around yeah. that number. You know, this, is, this was literally the highest on record uh, numbers of people coming in. So I think many people who, you know, most voters, if you look at opinion polls, want immigration to come down, both legal and illegal. Um, so, so I think, as I mentioned, you know, not just the NHS, but it's the inflation, it's, um, it's taxes, it's all of these things, and crime. Crime's a huge issue. Many crimes seem to have yeah. become completely decriminalized. Burglary, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Meanwhile, the police are, are, are wasting time on Twitter and um, diversity officers. So, I mean, there's so many things I could talk about, uh, the problems in Britain. Can we blame the Conservatives for that? I mean, they've been in power for 12 years. Conservatives have been in power for 12 years, and yes, of course, it's things that gave Ronald their fault. You can't sit down and say, oh, that was Gordon Brown's or Tony Blair's fault or Harold Wilson's fault. I mean, that would be absolute nonsense. Um, we, I mean, we've had a pitifully run Home Office for years. And I've talked to Home Secretaries in the past and they've said to me, oh, it's my civil servants. OK, we'll change the civil servants. You know, remind the civil servants that nobody elects them, but people do elect members of parliament and they do elect. And the Home Secretary is always a member of parliament, never in the House of Lords. So, you know, they, they have a, a, a constitutional mandate to do something about this problem. And I think the one reason why people get very nervous about discussing immigration is... It always comes back to racism. This is not about racism. This is about a housing shortage, a schools that are bursting at the seams, a health service that can't function, infrastructure that is collapsing. We, we physically can't cope with large numbers of more people. We haven't got the infrastructure. We haven't got the public services to deal with it. And until that is sorted out, we have right to control immigration. But also there are always going to be people that we need. You know, the, the labour market is a global market. And there will be people, whether they are at one extreme chief executives of companies that we want to get in to run our companies better, or people that we need to come and be plumbers or, or, or um, teachers or, or whatever, people with skills um, who are less highly paid. And we can't ever put up the, pull up the drawbridge and say you're not coming in. But yes, Brexit has been, in that sense, a disappointment. And, you know, it was the, what once Brexit was, as, it, as Johnson put it, done, which um, you know, he thought was at the end of 2020, nothing happened to embark upon enforcing border controls, having that programme of deregulation that might have in, increased growth and productivity. You know, people like me who are active supporters of Brexit um, sat around waiting for the politicians to take advantage of the liberty that this gave us. And we're still waiting. So when is that going to change? When's that going to happen? And it's, you know, it's derelict behaviour by our political class. I know there's been a pandemic, but that didn't have to involve the entire government. There were other people out there, you know, with trade portfolios, with, um, you know, in the Treasury, who could have started to look at ways of deregulating and making this country leaner and fitter and better at doing business in the world. And we've completely failed to take that opportunity, which is shocking. There are some countries who haven't relied on mass migration to fill labour shortages. Japan is one of them. They've invested heavily in capital machinery, etc. But that, that's a completely other thing. On the Conservative Party itself, many Conservatives, Conservative voters, lifelong Conservative members, feel that the party deserves to be wiped out of the next election. They feel betrayed, as I mentioned, particularly on issues like migration and crime and other issues. First of all, can Rishi Sunak turn it around? Second of all, do, do the, does the Conservative Party deserve to die? 
uh, the Conservative Party doesn't deserve to die because um, the forces of leftism in this country require an opposition. Now, uh, Richard Tice, Nigel Farage might say, well, we can do that. Well, good luck to you. Have a go. Um, any election is a battle of ideas. And frankly, if there's another conservative force in this country that can come up with better ideas and more credibility in implementing them than the conservative government of the last 13 years has done, then good luck to them. Uh, I'd be interested to see that. But until the Conservative Party finally collapses, no, it doesn't deserve to die because they, we need to have a choice. But is it a choice at the moment, though? I mean, the Conservatives and Labour seem so similar on so many things. Well, the Labour Party has been very clever in saying virtually nothing um, since Sunak became leader. Uh, I know that um, uh, you know Starmer is about to do that, but um, they're both engaging in what I call the politics of boredom. It's a battle of the bores at the moment. It's which of us can be more cautious, more boring, more sort of downbeat than the other. Um, because I think we've, we have got to the stage after the Johnson years where we know that reckless promises are very easily broken and that reputations are broken with them. So I think that given we are in a very constrained financial state uh, and things are not going well in quite a lot of sectors of the economy, that both uh, the leader of the opposition and the prime minister are being very careful with what they say and what they promise to do. I don't believe the Conservative Party deserves to die. I think there are a lot of very good people in the Conservative Party. Um, I'm afraid, again, I'm sorry to keep talking about him, but Johnson did value loyalty over ability and had one of the most mediocre cabinets imaginable, which is why they did so little and did it so badly. Uh, and I think if Sunak can show by the middle of 2024 that he is a more serious, more thoughtful, a more responsible Prime Minister, then there is a chance to limit the scale of the defeat that I fear the Conservative Party is heading for. Because the Labour Party at the moment show not many signs of being able to win a large number of seats in Scotland, I'm not confident that we're going to get a majority Labour government. But I think a lot of the Red Wall seats will go. I think the Liberals will win seats in um, shall we say, smart bits of suburban London and the West Country where the Tories are currently uh, the, the sitting tenants. Um, and that we will end up with some sort of um, supply and confidence arrangement between the Labour Party uh, and the Liberal Party after the next election, with, of course, the SNP usually not voting against the Labour Party because they have a shared ideological view, certainly of economic matters. So... I fear that Sunak uh, has come in to lead the Conservative Party to an inevitable defeat. I hope I'm wrong. I don't want to live in a left-wing uh, controlled country. But um, the Conservative Party has made a rod for its own back. I never understood at the time why so many Conservative activists, and I go and speak to them quite a lot, uh, came up and told me all the time what a very brilliant leader Boris Johnson was. And I would say, well, where's your evidence? And the fact was, well, they thought he told good jokes. We've now learned, I think, categorically, that being able to tell good jokes, and that assumes they were good jokes, is a measure of running a country well. And we have been really abominably governed, um, really f f all the way through this Conservative administration. I mean, the fact that Cameron in 2011 didn't implement Dilnot, the fact that Osborne went on and on about austerity when there wasn't really austerity, it wasn't that he was cutting public spending, he was just increasing it less quickly than, than uh, had been the case in the past. So there's been a, a, a long-running confidence trick. Cameron walking away on the morning of the defeat over the, uh, the Brexit referendum I think was unforgivable. I wrote a piece in the Sunday Telegraph the week before the, um, uh, the, week before the, the poll urging people to vote to come out, and I don't regret that for a moment but also saying that Cameron, if he lost, should stay and sort out the mess, because he called the referendum, and he called it for cynical reasons. He's afraid of Nigel Farage. Um, and him walking at that stage, handing over to you know, a complete incompetent like Theresa May, who was incapable of taking a decision. And then you go on to the, 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 the clownishness and dishonesty and incompetence of Johnson and the sheer lunacy of Liz Truss. I mean, where that came from, I still can't quite compute. 
I know Liz Truss thought she was a Thatcherite, but having lived through the Thatcher years, as I happily did, um, Mrs Thatcher never, ever um, borrowed money to cut taxes, which is what Liz Truss was preparing to do. So we, uh, the Conservative Party has betrayed the people who supported it serially over the last 13 years. It's only got away with it because the Labour Party usually has been in an even worse state. I mean, you know, Corbyn wasn't fit to run the proverbial bath, let alone a political party and let alone a country. But we should still vote for the Tories? I want to wait and see their manifesto. I've got a very good member of parliament where I vote, and I almost certainly will vote for her. If I, if I lived in a part of the country where I had a, uh, well, I think certainly any of the 102, whatever it was, MPs who thought it was a good idea for Boris Johnson to come back and fight another leadership contest, I wouldn't support that man or woman in a million years. I mean, happily, my member of parliament is extremely good and he's too sensible to have even thought about doing that. Um, so she'll get my vote, um, but I don't presume at this stage to, to advise other people that they should vote Conservative. I want to see the manifesto, I want to see what promises are made. Thank you so much, Simon Heffer, for joining us. Thank you very much indeed.